to today's Melanated discussion. We haven't had one of these in a while, so I'm happy to have these three ladies here. So as you guys know, or if you don't know, I've done a debt-free series to go over all the things my husband and I did to finesse quarantine and pay off $150,000 in debt. So now we've got these ladies here who are also debt-free to kind of tell us about their journey how they got to where they are right now and give us a little bit of tips on how you can start your debt-free journey and some apps that you can use that'll help you along the way if they use apps because I don't so I'm not giving you any tips on that but so let's jump into this everyone first do a quick intro and then we will get into the first question who wants to start us off I'll go, <laughs> go ahead. I'm Walmart and I'm debt-free <laughs> Bria, you go next. <laughs> I guess I'm Bria Bryant and bitch, I'm dead free too. Yeah, I guess I didn't really give you guys anything to say. I, just... I don't really know. I mean, I'm just like, I don't know how to follow that up. Like, what do you want us to say? How many years have you been debt free? Have you guys been debt free out of college? I have not been. Like, college up until just not even three months ago, I had debt. Mm. So I've been okay. debt free for three months. Trying to how okay. long have you been debt free? out of college i think there might have been a, a few months where i was paying off a credit card but like since you were 18 mm -hmm. 21 okay how about Wait, you you've been debt free since you were 21 i wish That's what? amazing can we do these intros i also still have the furniture i bought my first year out of college <laughs> wow <laughs> crazy Shana I wasn't ready for that I had no clue that's amazing it is it's pretty awesome okay yeah. um yeah not that shit but <laughs> I'm Bria and yeah I've been debt free for about five years since uh graduating undergrad um, and I'm Bukola. I was debt-free five years out of business school um until I obtained a mortgage um, but other than that, I'm debt free. That's what's up. Okay, so we're going to get into this first question, and it has to do with your debt freedom. We know Chana, the lucky Chana, she didn't have no debt coming out of college. But Bria Bukola, can you give a little like blurb about how you got into debt, about how much was it when you got out of college, and then how many years did it take you to pay that off? When did you decide that you were going to get debt free? after you accrued debt from school? I can go first. Uh, so most of my debt uh, was driven by me getting an education. Uh, so I went to Northwestern University and left school with about $80,000 of debt. And then um, I wasn't really able to pay it off. I was on one of those traditional payment plans. Um, and then I obtained even more debt and uh, got a degree, um, my MBA from Cornell University and left with $110,000 in debt. Um, <laughs> and also uh, got a lease on a car. So yeah, and so to answer your question, that's how I obtained most of my debt. And I decided to make a concerted effort to pay it down after I graduated from business school, because by that point I was able to make enough money to really make a dent against the debt. Right. So Bukola, was it 80 when you got out of undergrad and then you added an, another 110 or was it 110 total after you were done with everything? So undergrad and graduate school. Uh, they were separate. So it was $80,000 coming out of Northwestern and I spent some time paying it off before I went back to business school five years after I graduated. Um, and yeah, the MBA program was just expensive. I had to pay my own way for food, room and board. Uh, and then the actual degree, two years, two year degree. That yeah. is crazy. <laughs> I thought my 45,000 was bad. Oh my goodness. That is crazy. Yeah, we're definitely going to have to pick up on your tips and tricks. Yes. So Bria, how about you? Yeah. You know, um, the story of somebody that's just living well beyond their means, right. Even in their teens. So, um, so I went to university of Chicago, so Chicago stand up. Bacola there. Awesome. <laughs> or Evanston for you, Chicago for me. <laughs> um, I was a Gates Millennium Scholar. So I ended up going to university of Chicago full ride. Awesome. So it should have been, and it wasn't. 
um, because I was a very impressionable teenager that wanted things and wanted to live in certain places and was not happy living in the dorms. And so Mm. um, my university had those little stands, you know, for credit cards, right? I signed up for every single credit card I could and uh, easily probably had about maybe $5,000 in credit limit at 18. Uh, but never had have like never had a credit card before that and so I did not understand the you know the nuances of like you know what's a credit limit what's like you know minimum payment what's APR all those things so I racked up all these credit cards and uh, quickly maxed them all out most of them were kind of store cards maxed them all out and moved out of the dorms when I was 18. I wanted to live into uh, live in an apartment. I wanted an apartment high in the sky. Mm-hmm. I was just living beyond my means very, very quickly. By 19, I probably had racked up about $10,000 in credit card debt. And I was working more than I was in school. So grades started to slip, but I was working, you know, all these kinds of odds and jobs to like pay my rent. And then uh, when I somehow, some way graduated from University of Chicago, um, I was $25,000 in just credit card debt alone. Um, on top of that, I had paid, I had taken out private loans because I needed to subsidize paying my rent, which at that time was about $1,400 or $1,500 a month for a one bedroom back in 2005, <laughs> you know, so in Chicago, that's how Chicago, nice you know? so Very nice um, I was, I was, I was definitely living well beyond my means. And so I um, graduated with quite a bit of debt, um, moved back uh, to the West Coast, still not making much money, moved to the South, started making money as a sales executive. And at that point, which would have been when I was about 24, 25 years old, that's when I decided to start to chip away at my debt. Um, But by that point, I was probably about $33,000 in debt. And yeah, you know, it was just a conscious effort to say, look, you know, I'm going to live meager. I'm going to go without whatever I can do to make sure that I am, you know, chipping away, doing whatever I can per month to get rid of my debt. Um, But it it took a while because, you know, old habits don't die easily. So. Right. So Brie, basically you could have graduated with no debt, but you graduated with the average of what students graduate debt. Correct. How do you say that? Like, did I say that right? Basically, yep. average student usually graduates undergrad with about $32,000 in debt. And so right. rack that up a different way, but still left school with the same amount of money in debt. So I'm right. curious mm-hmm. with you and Bucola, you said that you started to chip away at uh, your debt after a certain amount of time. But like, was there something that like made you want to do that? Did you read a book? Like for me, I always thought like, okay, well, I'm just going to work and I'll have student loans because everybody has student loans. Like that's, that's what I would hear all the time. Well, you know, everyone has student loans. Why would you want to pay that off kind of thing? Mm. What like made it click in your head? Like, bitch, I don't want to be in debt. Like for me, it was, I don't think I want to be working until I'm 60 years old. So guess what? If I get rid of this debt and I decide that I'm going to, you know, put money in stocks or whatever, and then live off the interest, I can do that very early if I don't have any debt. So that was my turning point. What made you guys even want to do it? Because most people I know are just like, everyone has student loan debt. I'll just pay my 200 bucks a month. And that shit's about to sit there until I'm dead, basically. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, it was just the magnitude of the amount of debt that I had. Um, It was a large number. And after getting my MBA, I was able to do the math on how much I was going to be paying in interest and was over... $100,000 over the life of the loans. Um, And so I made a decision to uh, just get rid of it. I just did not want to have to live my life um, with that kind of debt. Um, I didn't feel comfortable like starting a family. I didn't feel comfortable buying a home with that kind of debt. Um, So that's ultimately why I decided uh, to make some drastic changes to, to get rid of it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, for me, it was, um, I don't know, trying to break a generational curse, I guess, you know, so like my one of the first books I ever received about financial wellness, financial literacy, and just wealth, right, was from my mother. I was about 10 years old, and it was Susie Orman's The Road to Wealth, and probably a bit too complex for a 10 year old. 
but my mother didn't have the capacity as a single mom, mm -hmm. nor does she have the, you know, the literacy around like, how do I educate my child on, you know, just being financially sound, right? You know, it just wasn't there. And so, you know, coming out of college and, and you know, Tierra, to your point, right? What a realization, right? It's like a girl, like you worked really hard in high school to like get a full ride to like a top institution, yet you still managed to graduate with the same amount of debt of any other college student, you know, in America. How did, where did you go wrong? It was kind of a realization of, you know, I need to get, get my, you know, house in order, get things in check. And so I kind of drew upon those memories of like that book and like other books about financial literacy that I had read before. And I knew that I wanted to be debt free for me to do the things I really wanted to do in life. So I love to travel, right? I love I have such wanderlust and I've always dreamt of like living abroad and all these things. And I was like, I want to be debt free before I move in that direction. And so therefore I need to, if I'm going to have that life, I got to get debt free now. Yeah. And I'm not trying to do, I'm not trying to live in this space of deficit forever. So it's like, what do I need to do now? What do I need to sacrifice now? What do I need to pare down on for me to be able to put that behind me and then start to actually live? And so that's the mind frame I was coming from. And on top of that, my mother had some health complications during this time as well. And so I had become a bit of her caregiver and caretaker and financial resource and and so it was a lot of just, I'm not doing this just for me, it's for her too. Yeah. And so like, girl, like, you know, you don't need this. You don't need that. You don't need that bag. You don't need those shoes. Like, girl, like, relax, get your house in order to take care of you and yours, but then also to start to realize your dreams as well. Oh yeah. Like Dave Ramsey says, live today like no one else. So later you can live like no one else. And I'm like, I fucks with that because um, I ain't got time to be working for 20 more years like I just don't see myself doing that like at all but let's roll into this next question and we're going to start with you Chana since you were the lucky non-debt carrier out of college person <laughs> so Chana kick us off with letting us know how do you manage your money today like do you write out like your budget every month like I do like literally by hand do you use any apps um yeah, just give us an idea of like how you manage your money and what does managing money mean to you anyways? Yeah, um, so I, I don't do a monthly budget. I'm actually in the phase now where I'm actually starting to rethink about how I, I use money um, and how I want to kind of think about my future. So I, I, I read something today, literally, that was like being debt free is not being financially free. And right. I think that was like so powerful to me because I'm, I'm debt free, but I wouldn't call myself financially free I still have to think about when do I want to retire and what's like how do I get there um, I still there's a lot of things that I still don't know about when it comes to like building wealth uh, but for me what I'm really good at is not spending money except for on the things that I really like so I have done monthly budgets in the past um, I've definitely used mint a lot in the past that was my app of choice not saying it's the best app or the worst app that's just what I used um, but really in thinking about how I stayed debt free, a lot of it frankly was out of fear and just like being afraid of going into debt coming from a family where like people fought over the credit card debt. And that would be, you know, a big explosive thing. So I didn't get my first credit card until I was about 24 or 25 years old. Okay. So everything that I did, I only did it if I had the money to do it. Um, and I want to caveat with like, I went to college on a scholarship. My mother bought me my car for college because like a lot of issue I have when you read about debt free articles is like start from here and you know be thrifty and it's like well you got to acknowledge the privilege you came in with like I went into college because I you know I, I worked my butt off in high school and my mom could financially provide me like the car to to this day I drive the same 2006 Toyota Corolla I got my sophomore mm. year of college mm. so like if for me, it was when I was 21, I didn't care that my car was that old. When I was 24, I was like, I guess it's a big deal that my car is older. And now I'm like, well, okay. 
<laughs> so it's for me, it was just easier to maintain habits that I had already established. But it wasn't necessarily that I established them because I was so bright and like so financially oriented. A lot of it was just dealing with I don't want to have debt. And I, even though my my parents were able to afford to give me things, I don't have the financial safety net to go back to them if I become, if I get into a cycle of debt. Right. And so for me, it was just like, what are the things that I really spend money on? And if you're friends with me, you know, it's food and drinks. <laughs> it's going out. You know, those are the things where I spend my money. And having a month, like having something like mint where you see it in cold dollars and cents, like it's like here it is. Um, for me, it helped me kind of make decisions about like, what are the things I'm really absolutely not going to spend money on or I can sacrifice? And what are the things that's like, be realistic, like you can create a budget around it, you're, you're going to blow it. So you might as well figure out how to not, <laughs> how to spend less in the other places you're budgeting more for because you, you don't care about them anyway. Yeah. How about you, Bria? How do you manage your money today? What does managing money mean to you? And are there any apps that you use or that you recommend? Well, I was hoping you wouldn't ask me this one. All right. <laughs> so um, I don't really manage it. Okay. So then <laughs> hear me out. Hear me out. Hear me out. So I use, of course, we, we all use some kind of something, right? You know, whether it's Quicken or an app or a spreadsheet or something, you know, um, if you're into budgeting, we use something. So for me, um, I appreciate banking apps that itemize and categorize spending. Yeah. That's helpful for me. So, um, you know, plug to your last video in the debt-free journey series about budgeting, <laughs> itemizing out, you know, like where your spend is going is so crucial. And as mentioned in your last video <laughs> free journey series budgeting um a lot of your spending kind of in those earlier months was going to uh eating out yeah right you know so um it, for me and for China has just mentioned I love to eat out and as a solo person you're not thinking about like oh I'm not spending that much it's just me right um, but, you know, as, as I have always stated, and I will say it again, I'm a firm, you know, advocate, and I love my Chase Sapphire <laughs> Reserve card, and it gives me an itemized spending um, every month of, like, where my, where my money is going, and pre-pandemic, I was probably spending about per month, I'm ashamed to say this, but it's a safe space. Folks need to hear this. It's about to be Probably about to, so. four or five thousand dollars a month. What? Just, just, just eating. Nope. She stands. Let me, she let, stands. Me, let me, let me, let me, Amy. You just say four to five. Oh my god! On eating out. And um, I thought Marcos and I were bad with the fifteen hundred. I'm like. <laughs> Pre-pandemic, -pre yes, like absolutely. I was hardly cooking and enjoying my life, right? And I would say even my credit card bill per month was about nine to $10,000 per month. Oh my per God. Month. Yeah, per month. Um, now, most everything went on that, on that, right? So like everything, but like my actual rent because they charged like a- right transaction fee, but like all of my utilities, like everything was going in that, but it was about $19,000 per month. And post pandemic or during pandemic, my average credit card bill is about three, between two and four, like this month's about 3,500, you know, but um, that just shows me that obviously um, I, I'll be just fine without all these other <laughs> without eating out as much and I don't mind stepping in the kitchen every now and again like it's okay like I'm okay <laughs> with that um but it's giving me like an insight and a revelation into like just because you have it doesn't mean you need to spend it right. and so I say all that to say that no I don't budget the way that I should right um I could probably have a hell of a lot more money in the bank if I budget the way that I think I should 
Um, but I, I don't, um, but the, you know, the apps that I have for my cars, like Bank of America, Chase, that itemize and kind of like categorize the spend helps a lot. And that was very revealing for me at the start of the pandemic. It's like, wow, you were spending a lot of money, Maria, a lot of money on hookah lounges. And just, <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, seriously, right? I mean, just like, you know, like, I, you know, just being honest, right? You know, it's like, you know, mindless things and, you know, um, right. that's a lot of money, you know, and it adds up. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I wish I had a more surefire budgeting schema, but I don't. But again, watching your your <laughs> last installment of the budget, it, it inspired me. It really did. It inspired me because, you know, those apps are great, but they don't capture everything correctly either. Right. right. So Bukola, you go and let us know about how you manage money. And then after that, I'm very curious, since China and Bria are not out here budgeting, I'm very curious as to how you guys are not going back into debt. So we'll, I'm going to, I want you guys to answer that after we have Bukola go over how she manages money now. And Bukola, if there are any apps that you use or recommend. Uh, sure. So um, we don't really, so my husband and I don't have a budget. Uh, we just have a percentage savings and investing target. Okay. each month. And so um, as a, you know, I think the percentage is like 63 or 65% now of our paycheck um, goes into um, either a savings account or it goes into our brokerage account to be invested. Okay. And that's what I shoot for. And then the rest of the money I can spend, if I have some money left over by the end of the month, I'll go ahead and throw it into um, like an investing account. Okay. Um, but for me, that's just the easiest, simplest way for me to manage. This way, Carl can spend money on whatever he wants to spend on. And then I can buy a new wig if I want to, or just, you know, (laughs) figure out how I want to spend my money. (laughs) Um, And then in terms of tools that I use, um, similar to Chana, I love Mint. Uh, I've been using that um, just to help me understand where things stand. Um, I don't really care so much about how it categorizes each of the different items that I spend against. Uh, For me, it's just super helpful just to track my investments, my mortgage debt, right. um, as well as what's in my savings account. Uh, so it basically shows you a summary of what your net worth is. Um, and for me, I'm just trying to kind of get my net worth to a certain point so that yep. I can be financially free. Um, so, but that's, that's how I manage it. Don't really have a budget. Uh, just I budget for the amount that I want to put away uh, to either save or invest. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. That's similar, I guess, to kind of how Marcos and I do it because we know where everything is going based off of what account it's coming out of. But then we only, we make sure that we allot X amount of money from both of our paychecks over into our joint savings as of now. And then later it will be into investments. So we have a certain, a certain number. And then after that, everything over that, we just, you know, we do whatever we want with it. Um, so I'm curious, Chana, and Bria, how are you not going back into debt if you are not necessarily monitoring, I guess, like where your money is going or not making like an allotment that goes to a specific place every month, um, even if it's just one allotment somewhere, you know, so you know you're putting something away or investing a certain amount. How are you not going back into debt, I guess? <laughs> I feel like after, I, I don't know, like when I went and did that transaction uh, thing, I don't know if you guys seen the last video, but I had did like an exercise where I did a like synopsis of six months. This was back in 2018 of all of my transactions I had to do with food. And one month it was like 600 and something bucks. And after that, it was $1,300. Then it was $1,200. And then the months after that was more than $1,300 every single time. And so it was like, when I swipe and I don't really pay attention to where my money's going, then that's when I start seeing, oh shoot, this American Express card is racking up. What the fuck? How'd this much money get on this card? Like not even knowing that I look back and I'm like, oh, I did buy that. Oh yeah, actually I did buy that. Like, so how are you guys not going back into debt? Because for me, it's a mindless thing and you don't feel like you're spending that much money, especially if you're not having to give somebody cash. So how do you keep control of it or keep it where it doesn't put you back into debt? I'll, I'll answer that. I kind of have a couple of different things and it's not um, like, it's not super systematic. So like there is an account that I put savings into that like direct deposit out of my check, it goes mm-hmm. there. Um, I love that. Like I should increase those targets. 
but for me, like, because I didn't have a credit card until I was m- more, much older, frankly, it meant that like, literally, like, I, I just didn't have it. So I had a, I had a habit of only purchasing what I could afford. Like that was just a muscle I built and I totally mindless shop. So like, don't think that's, Oh, I don't buy things mindlessly, especially if it's food. But for me, because I just had that kind of muscle kind of built up when I was, had more financial freedom, when I started to make more money, our financial freedom, I guess is just more salary. When I started to make more money, that was just kind of already in place so that I kind of knew to monitor, okay, what, what's kind of my playground and what can I spend money on? And there's things where I do have to think more deliberately. So I'm not routinely going on trips. I don't really shop. Um, like, so that's when I start to, when I do things that are outside of my norm, that's when I have to pay more attention to like, okay, what am I actually spending? Yeah. Because my inclination is just to swipe and say, well, I need these tickets to go home for a trip. But that's, that's actually abnormal spending for me. So I then need to pay attention to what I'm doing somewhere else to make sure I'm not setting, putting myself in a bad situation. Mm-hmm. So that's like, for me, that's what works. Um, I hadn't been a line by line, like I hadn't monitored line by line in a while. And I, frankly, just that just kind of drains me more than it gives to me. So I think for me, I have to just be really careful about spending what I have and using my credit card like it's my debit card. Right. So the credit card is, it is a tool to use, like pay my bills, the same way I would use my debit card, but it's not a tool that's in addition. And that was something I'm still getting better at, but something I had to learn to do as well, like using my credit card regardless of the limit in the same way I would use a bank card. It helps me to kind of stay in that playground. And then if I do something over, it's a cushion, but it really shouldn't be like, it really just should be like, this is the money I have. Right. Yeah, I'd like to come to, um, uh, back to Chana's point about using your credit card like this as a debit card, right? Like I'm very much a, you know, transactor. I don't revolve. Yeah. I never, I, I just don't, right? You know, yeah. that's not something that I would, would ever do, you know, cause like my, the APR on the one credit card I do have, even though I've been with that creditor for a number of years, it's still hovering around like 17, 18%. Yeah. And so I'm like, I'm not going to revolve any debt, right? I'm going to, you know, pay it off month to month. And so I, you know, I just have a very clear understanding of where, you know, what my income is, what's coming into my accounts, you know, on a monthly basis in this case, um, what I want to save. So that's one thing I will come back and say is, you know, I, even though I may not budget in a very, you know, kind of like structured way. Um, I still save, I still have a set amount of money that I save per month and it goes into a couple of different accounts, you know, Um, but the money that I spend on a credit card is, it's obviously got to be significantly less than what I make per month. Um, And otherwise I would obviously be going quicker and quicker into a downward spiral towards my debt, right? But I don't see myself like whittling towards a debt. Um, And it could, it could very well be that I, you know, I've saved very well, you know, over years past, I've invested somewhat well, and that I just make sure that for every job that I take every new job, I make sure that say the sign on bonus for that job covers at least one year's rent on the place that I'm moving into. So like, I'm not thinking about it. Right. And that's something I learned years ago. (laughs) I'm very cognizant of, you know, my baseline. Right. And then with that said, I'm very cognizant, obviously, as you should be anybody of what you bring in month to month. And that gap between what you bring in month to month and your baseline, which you have to work with and how you choose to manage that is totally up to you. So, okay. That's a good tip. Make sure that sign on bonus covers your fucking rent for the, the entire year. I'm taking that into the next. Oh, well, I'll just pass on that. People don't need to go on the next moves. Let me not get into details. So, like,